Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Charlemagne the Guy. We got a special guest in the building. You know what's interesting? I was thinking about, you know, organically, who was going to be the first guest in the new Breakfast Club studio. Because okay. to me, that's important. Because yes. you're setting off a new generation. Yeah. You're setting off a, a new chapter. So who would be the first oh, guest? Word. Wow. And I'm honored. Legend. We should be on it. Icon. Word, Come on, word, man. Word. Grew up on him. Come on, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Hey. Welcome. Word. You, know, you said first guest, and it didn't really register. Oh, when I said that, yeah, yeah, yeah before we start, yeah. But now, okay, I got it. That's yeah, you dope. are the first guest That's in dope. our new okay. studio. First ladies guest, and gentlemen, first guest of the year. First yeah, guest yeah, in the new I'll studio. That. Some word. of y'all know him as Theo Huxtable, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Welcome. Word. Thank you. Thank now, you very much. Well, I, I want to, uh, for, for people that, that don't know, I want to start from the No, no. You ain't asked the most important question. What? Have you played the Mega Millions? I thought you were going to say how you feeling, how you doing, how you holding up. Happy New Year. I, I guess I need to, huh? You need to, I man. Need to. So about okay. Billy, one point three billion. Okay, I did one. I did. I don't know. The last one was in the billions mm -hmm. a couple months ago. Yep. How'd you uh, do? Well, I thought I was doing good. Like I went there, I was like, "Yo, give me." Uh, uh. So my wife has numbers that are like her lucky numbers. So when the mm -hmm. numbers get real big, she wants to play those numbers. Mm -hmm. Correct. So and there's like three. So I, was, I took hers. And I was like, you know what? Play these. And I was like, I'm a splurge. Give me three more. You know, I think I'm doing good. And this cat next to me in the next lane, he was like, give me 200, uh, do, 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 do. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I didn't win, obviously. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> I don't have my own breakfast club, so clearly I didn't win. So you didn't win $2, $4, $8, $10, nah, nothing? Nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. So no. you didn't do good. That no, no. You didn't do good. But I'm, I'm, I might go back in, though. I mean, if it's okay. in the billions again. It's a billion right okay. now. Now All you're from Jersey City. Really now, for most people up. that don't know, how did you get your start in show business? Because we, we heard that you were a rapper at first. You were in a rap group. Yeah, yeah. Almost signed by uh, <laughs> Def Jam at the time. <laughs> Any truth to that? That was after Cosby, though, right? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was after, was after Cosby. Cosby. That was after Cosby. So how did you get your start with, with show business? I was uh, doing basically community theater. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was always looking for me to, uh, looking for things for me to do outside of going to school and coming home and hanging out. So mm -hmm. like I played basketball um, and that was my thing. I, th I thought I was going to be a basketball player. Um, and then one season, uh, one year basketball season was over. My mother's friend suggested this community theater and uh, asked me if I wanted to go. So I went down, auditioned, got in and found myself doing theater and just absolutely loved it. So like at nine years old, I was like, oh, this is this is what I want to do. And what it was, it was really, it was the, the first uh, curtain call. Like the mm -hmm. first play I did mm -hmm was called Alice Is That You, and it was basically uh, a takeoff of, of The Wiz, like Dorothy gets the Oz and everybody thinks she's Alice from Alice in Wonderland. Hilarious. Right, and I played the Tin Man, and I just remember the first opening night coming out for Curtain Call, coming out and people clapping and standing up, and I'm like nine years old, and I'm like, yo, I can, Got that get, bug. I can get into this. Yeah. People stand up and clap for you. Yeah, I like this. And at the time, Jersey City wasn't Jersey City now with these big skyscrapers and people dying to Yeah, it was buy. a whole different. It was a whole. Yeah. It was nasty. No one was scrambling to get to Jersey City. No. But 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 this was LA. I left Jersey when I was five. Mm -hmm. My uh, my parents uh, separated, uh, and my dad went back to Chicago. My mom took me back to California. So, uh the acting thing started in LA, but then when I, you know, years later when I booked Cosby, we obviously moved back to New York. How did you book Cosby? How, what was that that process like? That's funny. So my my when my agent first submitted me, uh, they were looking for a 6'2", 15 year old. Jesus Christ! Jesus, yeah, they, yeah. All in, they was all they getting were, ready for the NBA. They was clear. Well, because because <laughs> yeah. Ennis, at, you know, Ennis was fifteen and was six two. Who was Ennis? Uh, Mr. Cosby's son. Oh, okay, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So gotcha. in the original. Like in the original script, like there was this this running joke, like you know Theo would you know get in trouble with something, and Cliff would be like Theo stand up, and Theo stands up, and he's towering over Cliff, and Cliff would be like Theo sit down. Oh, okay. So they were trying to get that. They couldn't gotcha. find that kid. Okay. And uh, literally at the, uh, so I you know she submitted me. They didn't want to see me. And at the last minute, she resubmitted me because they couldn't find the guy, and they were doing network callbacks. This is crazy because this was. Good Friday, 84. Uh, I auditioned uh, at 6.30 on Friday afternoon, and the network callbacks were that Monday. 
So they were already flying in somebody from Chicago, flying in somebody from New York. So I was literally the last person they saw. And um, when I went in for the network callbacks, I went in and I did the audition like, you know, you see, you know, I, grew, I was watching different strokes and mm-hmm. whatnot. So you see kids being smart Alex and talking back to the parents and rolling their eyes. So I was doing the scene like that. And in the room is, you know, network, um, you know, producers, studio, and I'm killing in the room. Everybody's like, I'm hitting all the all the beats and everybody's laughing and I'm killing and I finish and everybody's like, cool, except Mr. Cosby. And he's looking at me and he's like, would you really talk to your father like that? Mm. And I said, no. He said, well, I don't want to see that on the show. Mm. So you go back out and you give me something else and come back later. And because it was the network callbacks, like everybody was there. So they had, you know, auditioned everybody for the other parts. And then finally I came back in and uh, gave him a 180 degree turn. Well, clearly he saw something in you, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they, you know, they gave me the shot to come back and redo it, and uh, that's how I booked it. You know what's so. interesting about what you said earlier? Uh, you said that you was in theater at nine years old. Mm. So people see these gifted young actors on shows like Cosby back in the day, and we don't realize the background because... Nowadays, it feels like it's no point of entry to you know get on these TV shows right. or anything. Or, 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 or social media, or social oh, yeah, media right, becomes right, right, dangerous. Right, right, yeah. right. Like you actually yeah. went and were perfecting your craft before you got to that point. Yeah, and I still do. Like I've always, I, every couple of years, I'll do theater. Even when I was on Cosby, I, I, like I always go back to theater because that is the, uh, I mean that's the that's the foundation. Mm-hmm. You know, so I always say like theater is my favorite platform. Uh, television is my favorite paycheck. Mm. But theater is really like like that's mm. I mean that's that that's that's the shit right there. And have yeah. you ever just sat back and reflected on what you and the Cosby show meant to black people in really the world from eighty four to ninety two? Yeah. Yeah. Um I I, I mean it, we it's something that we still talk about. Mm-hmm. Right, so who's we? When um, you say we, the cast. I mean, no, no, I'm saying we, like, like the worldwide, culture, the, culture, we, the culture, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, it, because it, 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 it's had a an indelible, um, irreversible effect, yeah, you know, on the culture. So, I mean, it's something I'm very proud. Like, no matter what, I'm very proud to, um, you know, have been a part of that mm-hmm. and part of that, um, you know, just to, to have that kind of, I guess, influence, mm-hmm. if you will. And I think when I was younger. You know, it was always, I was always trying to escape this role model, you know, title. Because I was like, oh, Malcolm Jordan is a role model. And my thing was always, um, we always equate uh, perfection with role model. Mm. So I never wanted the pressure of being, you know, uh, being seen as flawless Mm -hmm. because I just, I didn't want that. Like, that wasn't me. Um, So I used to kind of, kind of shy away from that, you know, that title, um, but and now that I'm older, not that I want to be considered a role model, but I do understand the, uh, you know, having the platform. I understand uh, having the ear of young people. Like you know, fortunately, I'm still at a place where I'm still relevant enough, where you know what I say can still have influence people on young gonna people. People will always listen to you because of that. Time period. Sure. Yeah. Straight yeah. Up. Yeah. And I, and and that's something I take seriously. So mm-hmm. I was I was really fortunate because we shot Cosby here in New York, mm-hmm. um, and you know during during the eighties, man. You know, y'all didn't show the other was, side man. of Brooklyn. <laughs> that wasn't Brooklyn. No, that was actually that, that was actually the, no. We so we we shot in Brooklyn, then we shot in Queens, but that um. That stoop, that front stoop was actually in the village. In the village, yeah. Yeah, that wasn't even Brooklyn. Right by the old station. Yeah. I was going to ask, Theo, you being, you know, always looked at as Theo, does that ever bother you? Because with certain characters that we always look at, whether it's Steve Urkel, he's always going to be Steve Urkel. And and you're always Theo. Does that ever bother you? No, it doesn't bother me. But there's, you know, there's been this, um, I guess, this this, this wave of interpretation that bothers me because if someone calls me Theo, I'm like, no, my name is Malcolm. Or, but I've always done that. But some people, they misinterpret it as, like, I get mad when people call me yeah. Theo. But my thing is like, no. And even when I was on Cosby, I wouldn't answer to Theo because as far as I was concerned, Theo was not going to be the end-all, be-all for me. Like, mm-hmm. at 15 years old, to think, like, oh, if this is going to be the height of my career, that's a depressing thought. When the show uh, first aired, you know, I'm 14, you know, the, the ratings are out the box. And my mom sat me down. She said, baby, 
it's great that this show is the phenomenon that it is, but you know how this business is. This show could be over next year. What are you going to do when the show's over? She said, I can type. I can always get a job. But what are you going to do when the show's over? So she impressed upon me the concept of longevity. Mm. So I wasn't, you know, I when I was on the show, I never answered to Theo. And especially now, you should know. I think right, right, like now, if somebody calls me Theo, they're being a dick. Yeah, because they think, know my name. Right, and I also I, don't know. think people look at you as Theo. I, like I, I get what yeah, you're saying. The they shouldn't Theo. at yeah, this point. Yeah, like you've done a you've done a lot other than Theo. I mean, you yeah. had a whole other show with your name in it, man. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. How long did it take you to adjust to life after Cosby Show? Like, how how did things look in '92? Well, I'd always prepared for it. Mm-hmm. That was the thing. Like, I was you know from that conversation that my mom had with me. Um, we literally spent each year of that show as if it were the last year Mm -hmm. because we didn't know. Um, So I had always prepared for for life after Kazi. So when the show was over, I had my own show for a half a season uh, on NBC. And then from that, I went straight to theater. Um, So I I was, I've always, I've always worked. No, there may, there may have been, you know, uh, longer stretches of an, of unemployment than I would have liked. But we're talking like maybe, you know, two, three years. You know, but I always knew that the transition from being seen as child star to being taken seriously as an adult actor mm-hmm. wouldn't necessarily be a smooth one. And that's why I started directing early. Like I started I directing like sixteen. By eighteen I was directing Cosby episodes. I was directing music videos. I was directing Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So when really? I came off of Cosby, yeah. What episode? Yeah. Ah, uh, I think it was the episode with Raven, one of Raven Simone's episodes. Okay, yeah. I was. I wonder. Um, did you look at Bill Cosby as a father figure because you were around him so much? You did so much acting, like right. And and it, and I mean, you were a good actor, but it was believable. It seems like you admired him as a father when I when I would watch the show or even see you behind the scenes of the show, or whatever. Well, remember, I was doing theater. I was pre- I was perfecting my craft <laughs> at night. That's so, a great job. All right. No, because I, you know, I, I, my father has always been, you know, an integral part of my life. So mm-hmm. I, I have a father. Um, he was, uh, you know, Miss Cosby was obviously someone I worked with, someone I respected. But Ennis was also, you know, a close friend of mine. So he was also like Ennis's dad. Gotcha. So it wasn't. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would definitely say he was a mentor because mm-hmm. he, you know, he schooled me on a lot of, you know, on a lot of things. But the um, I, I love the father son relationship between Cliff and Theo, but that wasn't that wasn't our relationship. But we're, you know we're mad cool, but it wasn't the it wasn't the father figure. Now, as a mentor, did he school you on to contracts and negotiations? Because no, that thing. He said no. It's still on now. On and I'm like, own. do you still get paid? And was everything taken no. care of the right way, or is it you were a new actor? You got got. Yeah, yeah, we got. Well, now nah, I want to say we got got. That's not fair. That's not. <laughs> That's completely unfair to say we got got, but I will say this. So yeah, so we get residuals, right? Mm-hmm. But the thing that 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 people don't necessarily understand about residuals is every time an episode repeats, you get a a percentage of what your original paycheck was, and that show has repeated forever. Correct. Mm-hmm. So let's say to put things in perspective. About 10, 12 years ago, I remember getting an episode check for $64. <laughs> that's how the residual check right. would be, a that's quarter a, sometimes. Yeah, like, like yeah. At, at, at some point, the uh, sending the check out costs more than what the check yeah, is. Correct. So for a period of time, though, um, that lump sum was a nice padding. But then after a while, you know, once it just keeps airing, it's not a whole lot. Um, but when you have uh, points, when you've got back end, that's when you're forever making money. Because when they syndicate the show, however many times they syndicate mm-hmm. it, you have a piece of the show, so you're getting that kind of money. We didn't get ownership. Gotcha. Yeah. We had no no back end. We didn't know about back end. And even if we did, we didn't have any leverage to negotiate that time. Right? Yeah, well, all yeah. new. You yeah. said something that made me feel like I'm going to fail a Black History trivia question. What show did you have on NBC for a half a season? Oh man, it was. Uh, trust me, you're not a failure. They, 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 they dick me on that too. It was a show called Here and Now. I um, definitely don't remember that show. Yeah, it came on. It was, so it came on. It came on Saturday nights. It was. Uh, it came on after or came on before. It was a show called Out All Night with Patti LaBelle. I remember Out All Night. Morris. So, yeah, so we were on. I was on there. 
Were you really? Yeah, yeah. With, with more chestnut? I was. He mind. thinks he's more chestnut. <laughs> oh, got it. He got, swears uh, he looks oh. like more chestnut. <laughs> It's, it's so disrespectful to Morris Chestnut, but he swears. Morris said he gets mistaken for me sometimes. <laughs> it just recently happened. You were the only one that like. Well, it what? happened. No. I'm only that. No. All right. Oh God, that's hilarious. I remember out all night. I definitely remember that. Patty Labelle, Morris yeah. Chestnut. Yeah. My goodness. So it was during that time. So here, so this is something that's really interesting. So we had that show. Um, the the president or the programmer at NBC at the time didn't like the show, right? And didn't think the show was going to do well. And it was basically, you know, um, it wasn't Theo, but, you know, my character worked in the community center uh, in Harlem. And uh, the program of NBC didn't think it was going to be a funny show, didn't think it was going to work. We shot the pilot, and they do what's called uh, pilot screening week, where they get all their pilots, they screen them, then they get rated, and then that's how they decide what's going to go on there. Um, my show came in number two. Mm. So really the only question was, um, do we put this show you know, on Thursday night before a different world or after a different world, right? Because mm -hmm. so for, for eight years, if my face is, you know, if, if America is used to seeing my face at Thursdays at eight o'clock, it makes sense that if mm -hmm. my pilot does well, you're gonna put me on Thursdays either at eight o'clock or 8.30. Mm -hmm. they, uh, the programmer still didn't like the show and he put me on uh, Saturday night. Which is why nobody ever heard it, because you know nobody watches my Saturday audience night. is not going to be watching TV yeah. on Saturday night. And then um, when the number one rated, the number one pilot they put in that eight o'clock slot, they canceled after two weeks. Wow! So we're like, okay, cool. They're putting the number two in that slot. Kept me on Saturday night. Then they put out all night in that slot. Wow! Like NBC, just they were not trying to hear that show, no matter how well it did. So we got we got canned half a season in. I think NBC dropped the ball because you know how different world was Lisa growing up being in college? They could have did that with all the kids. Like they could have did that with you mm -hmm. growing yeah. up. I feel like your adult life should have been explored in that way. Well you know it's interesting different world. Oh so let me go back just real quick. Mm -hmm. So uh so, so what you don't know about that show here and now, uh this cat named Dante Bizet was on the show. I don't know who that is. Right. Everybody knows him as Yasin Bey right now. Oh, oh wow. Lauren Hill was on the show. Wow. What? Uh yeah, Omar Epps was on the show. What? Wow. Yeah, yeah, but they 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 NBC just they, they didn't dig the show, and so of course this is before they blew up. But yeah, but they were all on the show. That could, if, if they'd have made one little adjustment and made you Theo on that show, and you older now, I bet you it would have worked. You know what? It's possible. I want I want to ask possible. you know, out of all your episodes, I'll ask Charlemagne. So my most memorable. Cosby show is of course the Gordon Cottrell season one episode sure. eight and sure. of course that's not the most memorable that's, I, I, uh, for, course, for, for maybe uh, course the airing maybe your two oh, of them that was episode eight I think it was season it was one good. episode okay. eight of course good. the airing the airing, the airing yeah. dance mania I did the Good same enough. thing when I got my airing so what dance was your, mania what was your favorite all of those but I think that at the top of the list would be the pilot when uh, Theo was getting D's in school and they did the whole monopoly money thing mm -hmm. and um you know, Theo Leaning gives back. this whole. The, that was the earring. Yeah, it was the earring. Oh, the earring. Okay, yeah, 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 that was the earring. And you know, Theo gives this speech. You know, like you know, Dad, I just want to be regular people. Like I don't want to be a, a doctor like you. I don't want to be a lawyer <laughs> like like Mom. I just want to be regular people. And why can't you love me for me? It was like this beautiful heartfelt. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the that. audience claps <laughs> and the whole nine. And Cliff looks at Theo and he says, Theo. That was the dumbest yeah, thing yeah, I've yeah, ever yeah, heard yeah, in my yeah, life. Yeah, and so for me, that was significant because you know, it, it set the tone for the show. Like any other show, at that point, the music would have started. Correct. The father and son would have hugged. Yep. But he, you know, he went left with that. And I just love that because that set the, 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 the tone that this was going to be a different kind of show. Gotcha. We're going to talk to you about other stuff other than Cosby. I just, okay, want, good, I, you know, good, as a good. fan, I got to get some. Yeah, no yeah, doubt. Yeah, let's no doubt. Come. First time here, we got to go. <laughs> yes, no you, doubt. No, all good. Did you all ever good. keep the Gordon Gartrell shirt? I did not. I think it's in the Smithsonian, if I'm not mistaken. It should be. Wow. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. That was yeah, a classic. Yeah, that, that was that was one of our that was that was definitely one of our our most fun, and for me most memorable, episodes. Did you yeah. ever get approached about doing a Gordon Gartrell clothing line? Malcolm Jamal won his Gordon Gartrell. <laughs> I'm surprised I have not. Mm -hmm. But I see there's a Gordon Gartrell like t shirt line out somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, gonna ask how much of the show was uh free free done and how much was actually written? Like were you allowed to go off script? Because some of that stuff just seemed like y'all were going. We we had to often go off script because it so it takes 
Um, it typically takes five days to do a sitcom. Uh, we were doing, the, we got down to like three and a half days. And, you know, most of those uh, storylines came from Mr. Cosby's monologues, right? So we were a very under-rehearsed show. So when it was time to tape the show, oftentimes, you know, if Mr. Cosby had like a monologue or something, he wouldn't know the monologue. So he'd like, he'd go left. And the fun part for us was when we, when he went left, we had to go left with him. So, you know, for me, it was great because I was like, oh, this is theater. Now we just, you know, we, yeah, you know, no. you follow, you, you follow the leader, you follow the followers, what we call it. So, uh, you know, and, and I love seeing those moments uh, with him and him and Olivia were cool. But like those moments with him and Keisha, mm-hmm. you know, because at the time, you know, Keisha was four. So she didn't know how to read. So she had to know. She had to remember what to say, how to say it, wow. and when to say it. Mm-hmm. Wow. And the when was always wow. based on the line before. So she's doing scenes with Mr. Cosby, and she's waiting for her line, and he's just talking. And they would just make – it was just really cool to watch her. And if you go back, you could just see her little brain processing how to maneuver through, you know, what's happening. Mm-hmm. So uh, so though stuff was written, uh, you know, there was stuff that had to be – Kind of off book because we were we were following him and wow. Felicia was the best at that. When you look at those episodes, absolutely. Do you do you believe Malcolm and Eddie gets overlooked when it comes to the conversation of like classic black sitcoms? Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, because people people do talk about it a lot. Um, you know, and that was an interesting time for me. You know, having come from NBC where. You know, everyone was made to be ultra aware of the images of black people we were putting across the airwaves mm-hmm. and then going to UPN where their whole <laughs> approach was <laughs> the antithesis <laughs> of that. Word. So that was that was a it was a difficult shift for me because I was thinking that I was of the mindset that they knew where I'd come from. Mm-hmm. They knew I was on a show that made history. Uh, where black people that showed that black people could be funny without being stereotypical, um, and you know, when I got to UP and I realized they weren't interested in any of that, and you know, and for eight years I watched Mr. Cosby, um, like all of the things that all of the stereotypical things that we did not see on that show, was not because the writers were not writing them, it was because Mr. Cosby was like, no, that's not what we're doing, mm-hmm. that's not the tone of the show, that's not who the Huxwells are, we're not doing that. So I saw him do that from season one to season eight. So I figured, okay, I'm at UPN. I know how how it works. Um, but, you know, I was not Bill Cosby, and we were not doing Cosby numbers. So mm-hmm. nobody really cared about what I cared about in mm-hmm. terms of trying to, you know, not be, you know, not do the same typical black sitcom approach. And, you know, I fought with writers, producers, studio, network, um, and, you know, the show was not as, uh, you know, it was not 100% what I wanted, mm-hmm. but, you know, it wasn't as, uh, you know, s- s- stereotypical as they were trying to make it. Gotcha. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, lo- I-, I love talking to, you know, p- people from that era. You know, we had Kadeem Hardison and Jasmine Guy up here. Mm-hmm. Erica Alexander's been up here. And I asked them all the same question. Do you think it was an intentional shift? I'm just going to say by they because I don't know who it would be to change that kind of content. Because when you think yes. about that era, yeah. it yeah. was all positive black content, yeah. intentional positive black content, but then it just seemed like it just shifted. Yeah. You yeah. think that was purposely done? Yeah. It was It was like a um, um, like a reaction to, like we had this couple of years of like, you know, family and mm-hmm. positivity. Yes. And, and, and and not just in, in, in black sitcoms, in sitcoms period. Like, you know, it was the, it was the family values, it was positivity. Mm-hmm. Then there was The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was Roseanne, mm-hmm. right? So that kind of kicked off. It was almost like there was a backlash to the family values and positivity. So I, I 100% wholeheartedly uh, believe it was it was intentional. Now, when it comes to when it comes to to, to black sitcoms, um, you know, I think the thing that everybody missed was, you know, people looked at the Huxtables and was like, oh, this was this is an upper middle class black family. So. Mm-hmm. We can do black sitcoms, and we can give these, you know, black uh, characters uh, professions, but the execution of the comedy was still the same. Mm. Like the thing about w- what made Cosby different is the 
the comedy wasn't predicated upon being black. That's right. right. Black sitcoms, the yeah. comedy is predicated upon being black. That's right. So I think that's the 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 the, the missing piece that the you know following black black sitcoms uh, missed out on. They're like, okay, well, let's make them a professional, but it can still be, you know, we can still jig. Right. You know. You I just never show? understood how things went backwards because mm. Cosby Show's big as hell. Yeah. In a different world. Hugh, all you know, Martin, all of these shows, big, living single, and we go back to we go. Back to nonsense. Like I feel like you would build upon that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there, it was. I, I definitely wholeheartedly agree. It's a intentional. It was an intentional shift. By I was who? gonna ask. By you know, who, we by they. By they. By they. <laughs> <laughs> now, Charlamagne yeah. talked about it before about the influence, but you know, looking back at it now, do you know? Do you guys know that you guys? Or, and this was maybe what you were setting out to do. You got. You guys raised so many families of yeah. what to do, how to act, how to talk to kids, how to have difficult conversations, how to, you know, speak to each other. And then even with a different world, like I tell everybody, that was the reason why I went to Hampton University because of a different world was Hampton yes. to me. Yes. Yeah, man. You know. So yeah, do y'all look yeah. back and say, "Damn, we raised a generation." Yeah, but that was that was his intent. Like he was very clear on what he was doing. And he was very clear that he wanted those shows to be timeless. Um, that was something he talked about consistently because there were times, you know, I'm 15, 16, I'm trying to use, you know, whatever slang we were using at the time. And he was like, no, don't. that's going to date the show. Mm. Let's make up wow. our own slang. Wow. So in 25 years, when people are still watching the show, the show is still relevant. So, uh, wow. you know, our credit to him because that's what he... That's what he set out to do. How did you mm. feel when, like, uh, I would say a couple of years ago, they tried to take the show off? Yeah. Um, it bothered me because although everything that was going on, the show was so positive for our culture. So how did you feel when they started taking the shows off of syndication and yeah. were threatening to pull the shows off different networks? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, real, you know, the real, it hit, it hit us all financially. Because be, now we weren't getting those residuals. That's sixty four dollars. You know, yeah, <laughs> sixty four dollars. But was... that lump, you know, you talking yeah. about you talking about eight years right. of residuals. So that's still a nice little padding. Um, so it's interesting. I did a uh, in two thousand fifteen. I put out my third record, right? And on that record, I mean, I got I got Layla Hathaway. I got Robert Glasper. Is that I got Lettucey. No, this that was that, that's this one that's out now. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, that was called Selfless. Okay. So Layla Lettucey, Stokely, Rasan Patterson, Robert Glasper. Like the album is like it's a banger. I could not book any press unless I agreed to answer at least one question about Bill Cosby. It was the only That's way ridiculous. I was going to be able to get my record covered. Wow! So I do this. Uh, That's crazy. This 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 interview with with AP, right? We spend 25, 30 minutes talking about my career, talk about my music. Like it's a dope interview. And then at the very end, the last question she asked me is, "What do you think with the Bill Cosby controversy?" that the legacy of the show has been tarnished. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, yeah, of course it's been tarnished because they've taken it off the show. And whenever we talk about uh, stereotypical black images you know, on television, we've always had the Cosby show to hold juxtaposed against that. Mm -hmm. But we no longer have that. The next day, all of the headlines read, I remember that. Malcolm <laughs> Jamal Warner says the legacy of the Cosby show has been tarnished. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not even what you, you said. Know, yeah. yeah. So then I remember a couple months later seeing Keisha on some some talk show, and they asked her the same question, and she said, "No, uh, it, it's impossible to tarnish the legacy of that show because there's a generation of kids who sought out higher education because of that show. Facts. There are a generation of kids who grew up and got married and had loving families because of that show." There's no way that you can reverse the influence that that show has had on the culture, and so now I'll, I'll always bite her. Uh, always bite her response now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, I mean, it's it, it's it's undeniable, and it's irreversible. You know, it's had a uh, you know a, a huge impact on on, on our culture, um, and it had a, a huge global impact on how black people mm -hmm. you know saw themselves. I was going to ask you, uh, you know, what's the pros and cons of having your name in the title of a sitcom in reference to Malcolm and Eddie? But to me, it's the same thing with that. I think if that show was called The Huxtables, it wouldn't even be a conversation. Sure. I think if it was called sure. The Huxtables, sure. people yeah. would easily be able to separate the art sure. from the artist. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so what, what, what do you think the pros and cons are? Uh, probably that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Really, you know. Um, 
I think probably anybody who, who's who's having their own show and their own sitcom. Because also remember, you know, so many sitcoms are usually based around a stand-up. Right. Um, and, you know, either they can handle the job or they can't. You know, that's, the, mm-hmm. that's what the success of the show depends upon. So I think for any stand-up to have your own show and uh, have it be your name, like, that's the dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think to your point, that's, that is, that's a, a huge con. Um, but, of course, no one goes into it thinking that, you know, there's going to be the end result of yeah, of that. I remember they did that with uh, the new the the new Roseanne relaunch. Oh, the Connors. They changed they it to the Connors. Connors. Yeah. yeah, after yeah. when she got into her Earth situation. Mm-hmm. Now, are you are you still cool with cockroach? Call Anthony Payne. <laughs> we're cooler now. We're, we're cooler as adults than we were during that time. Really? Well, y'all didn't get along back no, then. No, no, we didn't. Not at all. No, we this didn't. young ego and yeah, yeah, that's what it was. All right. Yeah, and it was and it was yeah, yeah. It was it was um. You know, when I talked about earlier, the original callbacks for Cosby, the uh, I told you they they flew in an actor from Chicago mm-hmm. and flew in an actor from New York. Carl was the actor they flew in from New York. Mm-hmm. So had I not auditioned for the show, Carl would have played Theo. Damn. So, I got to look at you every day and see you took my part? And then I got to come back and play your best friend? Damn. So, you know, I think on one hand, you know, that may ha- have had something to do with it. Like, no, that was part of it. Um, and he just had a, he had a huge ego. From New York. <laughs> you know, yeah, he had a huge ego. So, and I didn't come from that kind of place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the way, I, and the, the way I felt then and the way I feel now, you know, based on my career, if anybody you know, should walk around with a huge ego, it should be me. Right. And if I don't roll like that, mm-hmm. I don't really, I have very little tolerance for people who roll like that. Mm-hmm. So we never really, we, really, we just never really got along back then. But, you know, we're grown now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Carl's been through a lot. Like his journey is, you know, it's it's been, you know, it's, he's had a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and as adults, we've been able to like sit down and have conversations and we're in. That's dope. Uh, we're in a very cool grown man place now uh, than we were. Yeah, then we were teenagers, and you know, I feel like you had to be broken older. up with something the way you sounded. Like. I had to be broken <laughs> up before, like was some furniture moving. Like, like. no, 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 that wasn't that bad. Okay, okay, it wasn't that bad. Do you okay. still speak to anybody from the show any anymore? And you know, yeah, Keisha. Oh, yeah, um, so you you still cool with Keisha? Keisha's my. I mean, Keisha was my girl when she was four years old. It's always my little homie. Um, you know, we both live in Atlanta. Uh, just Saturday, uh, her and her husband were over at our house. Her daughter is a couple of months older than my daughter, and our daughters absolutely love each other. So, so it's it's very surreal because Keisha and I like we we'll look at at our daughters playing and look at each other like, yo, this is wow. bananas. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's dope. Yeah, so she's one I talk to the most. Um, but we're all we're all cool. I mean, we we had an experience that. Uh, no one else in the world has had. So that experience has really bonded us forever. So even if we don't, you know, if we don't talk for a year, you know, whenever we talk, it's just always, it's always love. And never will have again. Because I, I, I tell people all the time, that 80s, 90s celebrity was different. Yeah. Like, there's not too many people, black or white, that was that famous in the 80s and 90s who aren't icons. Yeah. You might can run for an office without social and media. And win. I'm uh, serious. Without the internet back I'm then. Not even yeah. joking. Like you yeah. possibly What was the difference between now and then celebrity wise? Social media. Mm. Social media changed the whole game. Like for me, what I started to say earlier, growing up here in New York in the 80s, being on that show uh for me what it was the time of my life. Mm. Um and, and partially because I, you know, cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 14, 15 years old. I'm, I'm in the area. I'm in Studio 54. I'm at Latin Quarter. Like I'm in all these places I'm not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was so much of the being the, the, the celebrity hood, if you will, uh, that I enjoyed so much. But because of not just the success of the show, but what the show represented. I also understood that when I walked through the world, I was not only representing my mother and my father, I was also representing the show and everything wow. the show stood for. So it allowed me to um, not be a knucklehead. Like, be able to enjoy 
uh, everything, uh, but responsibly, and you know, do stuff under the radar. Uh, but even whatever I was, whatever I was doing under the radar wasn't like knucklehead stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, my parents had instilled a foundation. Um, uh, you know, my foundation of who I was was very strong. I was gonna ask you. You never got caught up in in the drug world or the no. alcohol because Studio Fifty Four lack right. quarters back then was no. I could be around it, but it just wasn't. That wasn't me. I mean, you know, look. My father named me after Malcolm X and Ahmad Jamal. Mm-hmm. Like my wow. father was not plain. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um. So that's why I say, like, like before the fame, my foundation was so solid that I could be, I could be around all that stuff and not have to participate in that. So to be able to to enjoy everything that being famous had to offer without being a knucklehead. And again, being in New York is different from growing up on television in LA. Because in LA, your best friend is on the same lot on the Mm -hmm. stage next Mm -hmm. door. Whereas here in New York, there weren't other shows here. So I wasn't hanging out with actors. Now, I got to give all props to your parents, though, because, you know, even when you talk to somebody like Kim Fields, it's the same thing. She gives all her credit to her her mom because... Y'all had every y'all had every right to wild out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> y'all were the biggest <laughs> things moving. Yeah, right? but we also we also came on the heels of Gary of, of uh, Todd Bridges and Dana Plato. So like, oh, we overlapped wow. their wow. you know wow. their journey. So wow. for I always felt like, well, we got no excuse. You learn from that. Yeah, like yeah. we're seeing, like it's you know, like you hear wow. about stuff and throughout history, but this was happening right now. Yeah, like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at wow. Ty Bridges. Mm-hmm. So there was really no excuse for us to wild out like that. Make but, those same mistakes. But again, yeah. I also say because we lived in New York and not L.A., we weren't hanging around other Hollywood kids when we were shooting in Brooklyn. Uh, the NBC studios on Avenue M and East 14th Street. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a commissary, so at lunch. We had to go out into the neighborhood mm-hmm. and get whatever we were gonna eat. We moved to, to, to Kaufman Astoria. Their commissary was whack, so we went out into the neighborhood and went and got Ooh, what we, right. we could get our lunch. So it was just a very different experience uh, that we had being able to grow up uh, in New York rather than grow up in television in Hollywood. You said something earlier, and I wanted to ask you about. And you were saying that when you were promoting your jazz album. A lot of these outlets were saying that the only way that you can come up here is if you ask a question, if you answer a question about Bill Cosby. Mm. How were you able to navigate all those questions? Because although you have your own stuff going on, you're yeah. doing plays, you're acting, you're doing movies, sitcoms, you know, you have your music, but you almost kind of want to be like, I get it, but this is what I'm here for. So how did you navigate through all that without, you know, going down those 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 lanes? Uh, by turning the, you know, by by. Whatever the question is, answering it, you know, the best way I could. Like I'm, I'm they want to even... know. Did you see him right, do this? Yeah. Did, what about this? Yeah. You, you know. And, and the 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 reality is, I'm not in a position. Like whatever it is you're trying to ask, I don't know. I was I was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um. And again, I you know that was that was Ennis's dad. You know. So I am not in a position to defend him at all. And there's no need for me to try to throw him under the bus. Because the rest of the world is doing that, and you know, like, like you know, the real shit is, I know what everybody else knows, and everybody else knows what the press has told them. So I don't really have, um, I don't really have a real ground to stand on to speak on it as much as anybody else does. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so. And you might be biased because you didn't, you saw a whole different side of him that none of us are privy to. Yeah. Yes, and 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 I and I saw a, uh, I saw a very human side of him. Mm-hmm. Like what well, everybody else is like, you know, he's America's famous, you know, favorite dad, and you know they they, as people do with celebrities, you know, they put us on a pedestal. And again, that's why as a kid, I don't want to be considered a role model and be perfect. Cause I'm like, right. that's not me. Mm-hmm. But that's what we do to people. So while everyone is, you know, rah rah rah, I'm like, he's a man. He's got he's got his own got his own faults and whatever faults I saw though it wasn't that I you know like mm-hmm. I saw a man mm-hmm. absolutely so it's a different it's a different experience for me uh, than it is for everybody else I, I've always loved how black your name is man and and finding out that you named after uh, Malcolm X and you said 
with me at Blue uh, Jamal. Uh, Ahmad Jamal. Ahmad Jamal. Ahmad Jamal. Okay, I'm not familiar with Ahmad, Ahmad Jamal. Jamal. He's a um, he's a renowned jazz pianist. Got you. But he's a <laughs> if you could be a jazz pianist and be militant as fuck, that's Ahmad Jamal. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. My dad was my dad was. I used to um, go to Chicago during the summers to see my dad. And during my summer vacations, he had this this thick book called Great American Negroes. And there were you know, chapters on Langston Hughes, mm-hmm. Richard Wright, Mary McLeod Bethune, Marian Anderson. And he would make me read these chapters and write book reports. Mm. And this is during my summer vacation. I'm six, seven, wow. eight, nine, ten years old. I'm like, I don't want to, but it's my dad, so I have to. Mm-hmm. But he was he he was hardcore on making sure that I under uh, that I understood my history and understood where I, where I came from, and also he was um, he went to he went to Lincoln University, and he was there with Gil Scott Heron and Brian Jackson. Jesus. And my dad went to Lincoln because Langston went to Lincoln, so the whole poetry uh, thing that I do like like I was really I was I was a poet before I was an actor. Because my father was instilling all of these things in me, and and he was doing it through the arts. Like my favorite book, uh, I remember being in fifth grade, and I used to carry around this book, poems on the life and death of Malcolm X, mm. and I used to have it on my on my my, my desk at school. Mm-hmm. And kids would like laugh and tease me, like, "Oh, somebody wrote a book about you, ha ha ha." And I'm in fifth grade, <laughs> and I'm realizing, wow, these not only do these kids not even know who Malcolm X is, if they're reading poetry, they're not reading poetry as sophisticated. Mm. as I am. And it was then like that was the that was when it registered for me what my father was doing. Like all those summers of not wanting to read these books and write these book reports, I understood what he was instilling in me. And then when I was about 15, you know, the, the, you know, the shows pop in and now I'm you know, I'm going to schools, I'm talking to kids, I'm at churches, I'm talking to kids. And it was that's when it hit me how my dad named me and what he was doing. Because now I'm having this influence talking to young people. I remember being 15 years old. I called my dad. I was like, yo, man, you set me up. And he laughed. He was like, you damn right. For well, greatness, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he didn't even know, you know, he didn't know that I was going to have this platform or what mm-hmm. my platform was going to be. But, yeah, he set me up for greatness. Absolutely. Whatever my path was going to be, he set me up for that. Why, why, when it came to musical expression, it was... Jazz, cause you you know you 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 a hip hop baby, like you came up in the hip hop. Yeah, era. like why? We just heard you rap yeah. a, about a month ago. <laughs> I don't know if I would call that a rap. He was rapping. Yes, what he was. was. That? What was that? The legends. You got when he was naming name. all the names, yes. I wouldn't call he that. He was rapping rap. in there. Yes, no. he was. Okay, so he put okay. it together. Okay. Spoken word. For that, but let's go. But but that was a plan for DMX. Well, but he was rapping. That's not me. That's not me. That's not you. What you mean? That's, that's not, not you. Me. No, that was a um. That's this this cat on Instagram, Cash Flow Harlem. He put that video out right. And I would see this video, and people were doing these remix videos. So you see the video on one side, mm-hmm. and you see people just kind of bopping the head. Oh, yeah. got you, got or you. You. Nobody's saying the names. They just kind of nodding. Bopping the head, And yeah. there's one guy, he was counting names, but then he'd lose count. Like, that's it. And I was like, that's it? So I was like, you know, I'm going to take the time. I'm going to memorize what he's doing. <laughs> wow. And then I'm going to make it a challenge. Nobody took me up on the challenge, but the video Went, went viral. viral. Cause that's the first yeah. time most I never I never even knew somebody else made that. I thought that was you. That was that was you. That was not me. That was not me. Wow. No. But um Why jazz though? So the jazz. Okay. So it's when I started my band, you know, like I was always doing already doing poetry, right? I was in the the, the 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 spoken word scene. I was doing spoken word with other bands and whatnot. But when I started my band, it was to I was playing bass and it was to kinda of, I wanted to do like this jazz funk kind of thing. And then ultimately, I ended up infusing uh, my poetry with my own band. And Neo Soul, you know, was big at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, because of the spoken word and what I was doing, they wanted to call it Neo Soul. And at the time, I was like, nah, Neo Soul is a fad. When that, you know, I don't want to be associated with a fad because when that runs out, you know, people not, might not be as interested in what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. If I call it jazz funk, then I could. It's something I could grow into. So when I'm 50, 60 years old, I can still be doing that. Mm-hmm. And at the time, now mind you, I'm 26, 20, I'm, I'm like 28 now. At the time, I was like, besides, no one's going to want to hear a dude rapping at 50 years old. Mm-hmm. Now, well, now, fast forward, yeah. <laughs> fast forward, yeah. you know, cast is still nice. But at 28, we get, we, at 28, we didn't see it. We yeah. couldn't see that. Correct. But, um, 
so the jazz funk spoken word was just kind of my way of uh having this this lane but it's really what i do is really it's you know it's soul r&b and hip hop mm-hmm. at the end of the day mm-hmm. um cuz i'm not though i'm a jazz student i'm not i wouldn't consider myself a jazz musician but i just wanted to use that title because i didn't want to get lumped in in neo soul I didn't want to just call it because it's not just R&B. It's not just and it's not just spoken word. It's not just hip hop. It's really a combination of all of that. So when I describe it, I describe it as a jazz funk spoken word band. Um, but it's probably more of a, you know, R&B soul uh, spoken word. band. And, and, and hiding in plain view is, is Grammy nominated, right? Or, yeah. Or what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. How does yeah. that feel? Yeah, it's dope. I got a Grammy in 2015 with uh, Robert Glasper and Layla Hathaway. Man, I did not know There's that. A, yeah, wow. yeah on, on, on Robert's Black Radio 2 album, he does a, a cover of um, Stevie Wonder's Jesus Children of America. And Layla sings, and then I do a poem uh, in tribute to the kids from Sandy Hook. Mm-hmm. And in 2015, wow. that won for Best Traditional R&B Performance. Oh, wow. So for this album, Hiding in Plain View, which is my fourth album, for that to get Grammy nominated, you know, like that, I mean, you know, it, it it takes it to a whole nother level. Like, of course, getting a Grammy, that's amazing. It means everything. But to have my own work recognized, and, and my own work that I did most of the production on myself, mm-hmm. uh, even though I don't do this for validation, it's so validating, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and it feels... Well, congratulations. Feels Thank you, man. Thank now, you. Now, another thing that you, people might not know, the Magic School Bus. Yeah. What made yeah, you get involved yeah. with the Magic School? Bro? I've been I'm, I'm I've been trying to do voiceover, you know, also my whole career, and right. so I, I get voiceover work here and there, but I'm it's, it's a nut. I'm still trying to I'm trying still trying to crack, mm-hmm. but um but I would say, uh, you know, I know you cats are busy, but whenever you get a chance, uh, I I implore you to listen to Hiding in Plain View. I would love I definitely because will. it's a it's a it's an album that I say it's. It's an album that can shift the way we raise black boys. Mm. Uh, on the album, I have featured throughout the album is uh, is award winning novelist and he's the assistant professor of African American studies at Clark Atlanta, mm-hmm. Dr. Daniel Black. And I have this one piece uh, after this poem, Asante Silence, a long music bed. And I knew I wanted to get a statement from him because he's just a he's he's a beast. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had this hour long conversation that I recorded, but he dropped so much knowledge that I had to put him throughout the whole album. Wow. Um, and I would dare say, I would go as far to say that, that Hiding in Plain View is one of the most important albums to come out in 2022. Uh, and a lot of that I attribute to him and the knowledge he's dropping because like the, the album opens, the first track is called Love Song and it's just him. And he says, the thing about a black boy is you don't necessarily want to beat a black boy. What you want to do is you want to love him so divinely. You want to love him so fiercely that your disappointment will kill him. Mm. You want him, you want to adore him so much that the last thing he wants to do is disappoint you. Like that's how the album opens. Wow. So this is an album, as I said, it has, it, you know, it, 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 this is an opportunity. It provides, uh, a shift in how we raise our black boys, which will then have a profound impact on how black boys relate to each other and black girls, which in turn have an uh, even more profound impact on how black men mm. relate to each other and how they relate to black women. And it's a, it, it, it can all be a, um, a significant step in our own self-healing. So when I talk to people about the album, I say this album is for us is for black boys, it's for black men, it's for black people, it's for non-black people who have the foresight to see that our self-healing is an invitation for them to examine their own necessary healing. Why, why do you call it hiding in plain view? Because it's, it's something that we all do. There's, a, um, there's actually a poem, uh, the title track on the album is called Hiding in Plain View, and that's the only piece without music. I just do that poem, strictly a cappella. And I talk about... Um, you know, hiding in plain view is something we all do. We all wear these masks, 
right? Because we're all trying to hide what we think other people won't like about us. You know, like I, I spent, you know, six years in a relationship, you know, halfway hiding because there were things I didn't think that, you know, she would like about me. And 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 at some point I allowed myself to uh, be disrespected, mm-hmm. you know, but I look at it, I'm allowing myself to be disrespected because I'm disrespect I'm disrespecting myself mm. because I'm hiding things about myself that I'm I'm afraid that she's not gonna like. And in a relationship, like that's the last place right. you should fear being vulnerable. So so that that poem Hiding in Plain View is is all about vulnerability and how vulnerability um you know, vul- vulnerability is a scary thing, even when you're on the men. Black boys boast bravado not to seem broken, and often so do black men. So I, so that poem itself, just in itself, I get so many responses from people who aren't black mm. that that re- resonates with. Mm-hmm. So it's an album that, on the though on the surface, it seems like I'm only talking about black boys there is a universality to the album that you know the responses like i said i've been getting from non black people it resonates with them too i know you i know you probably got to go but you, uh, when it comes to healing what was it therapy was it a spiritual leader was it just what was it uh people who i call spiritual leaders um my wife is a uh she got a master's in marriage and family family therapy. She's oh, wow. getting her PhD wow. in clinical psychology. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and it's not even and and, mm-hmm. and yeah, and not even that. And, and not that she's been doing work on me, but just I, you know, just I watch her, you know, and I watch her with our daughter. Uh, so that's what's helped me, like presently. But even before she and I met, you know, once I got out of broke up with my six year relationship, I spent like two years. I spent two years like a man who had been in a six-year relationship, and then at some point I was like, I need to, I need to stop. Like I need to go on hiatus and not do any dating, you know, not be in a relationship, not do any dating, try not to have sex. Um, but I had a, a, there was a space where I needed to get clarity for myself, and the only way I was going to get that clarity was by you know sitting down and really dealing with you know, whatever things in here That's right. that I was busying myself from dealing with. Because bu- be keeping busy is a, is a response to trauma a lot of times. Yeah. Mo- all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. all the time. So we got to talk about Accused. The reason you're here, you got you, you, <laughs> a new show on Fox called Accused. Yeah. It starts uh, January 22nd. Yeah, now man. tell us about Accused because there's not much on it. We I looked at the trailers. We all looked at the trailers. We see you in an in a, in a orange jumpsuit. So yeah. break down yeah. Accused. So Accused is a uh, a courtroom anthology series. Mm-hmm. So every episode is a standalone episode, like Twilight Zone or Black Mirror. Um, my particular episode uh, is I, I, I play a, a man whose daughter uh, is sexually accosted in a park. And I choose to uh, meet out justice myself. Handle things on your own. Yeah. And we know how that typically goes mm-hmm. which is interesting because we always talk about man if somebody touches my daughter da, 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 mm-hmm. da, da. and I remember saying that like probably 10 years ago before I even really thought I was ever going to really have kids and I remember saying to my man yeah man you know if I have a daughter man you know, I'll, I'll go to jail for my daughter and he said yeah and what good would you be to your daughter then mm. right and that changed my whole like I was like yeah, you're absolutely right like we talked that but no, I still feel like that though. I, I, I got four daughters. So I still feel like that. Same. I got four daughters. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, no matter how much therapy you do on yourself, no matter how much healing you get, you know, no matter how high your emotional IQ gets, I don't know what, yeah. what you yeah. would do in that situation. Right. Right. Man. And but and, and but his point was when you what good are you gonna be to your daughter when you're sitting there in jail? That's facts. Like That's true. you're n- now you really cannot protect your daughter. Yeah. Damn. You know, like that. I, think, I think about it like yeah. That. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. And he told me that like like ten years ago, and I was like kind of changes the doesn't make it any easier but I mean the feeling is still there but it makes you really go like yeah so you're only on one episode it's only one episode one episode yeah. okay but it's a it's a it's it's a powerful episode it's um it's hard to watch because of the the subject matter mm-hmm. um as I think it's that's what it is with all the episodes they're, they're they're tough to watch because the subject matter is really tough but the show um 
it's really good, and I'm I'm very proud of the work on that show. And again, it's just an, another side, like with the resident mm-hmm. um, as well. It's mm-hmm. just another side of me that people don't normally get to see because of you know most of the roles I get casted. I was gonna ask before you get up out of here. Would you mind doing a, a, a poem? Why don't we just play one from the album? Mm. He could do one. He could mm. do one. Go live. He's here. Would you rather do first, one? Would you rather do one or play one? First guess. Actually, you know? I'd, I'd like to do one and you play one. Okay, so let's do it. For you, <laughs> done, done deal. deal. I need both. Oh, done all deal. Right, my man. So to I the gentleman it. that calls every morning with, with, with a poem, <laughs> this, uh, this is how it's done. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, this piece is uh, Asante Sana. A body gone, comrade. What, you still on that freedom shit? Word? Well, yeah, you know me and this poetry, we still be on that weedum shit. That birthing inspirational couplets and breedum shit. That I spit cat should heed them shit. That words can't break my bones, but if you cut me homes, I bleed them. Shit. Atonement for the masses of hard asses and heads that tread on civil liberties in the most uncivilized of fashion is said to be dead. Can we afford to be dumb for free? See, that's the question I'm asking as I beg for an ounce of truth amongst the aloof surrounding me. My vices are proof that these demons keep hounding me. Reality keeps pounding me, almost astounding me into the strange hypocrisy You see, I preach the same hope that I'm losing daily, like my religion. Peep how deep I bear my soul. I stand on the precipice of this crossroads. It's like I want to give my life to the cause, but which one? Ignorance is running so ridiculously rampant, I can't tell if I'm hating or merely debating just for fun. Mm. But I do know. My heart heaves heavy upon hearing the fluttering hum of the feeble footsteps of fear, stamping out the ferocious flames of our dogged desire and determination to outpace the perilous prophecy our captors have programmed to be our faith, and thus our fate. I know my soul soul writhes with anxiety aches. Lies no longer need the skies when they start looking like the truth. Like, how do we ignore cries of ill-guided youth spitting dope bars of self-hate over beats that bang harder than strange fruit hangs? Meanwhile, her breasts hang and her booty bangs harder than the gun claps of rival gangs fighting over territory they don't even own. And in magic cities everywhere, she feeds her babies based on her ability to shake what her mama gave her because her pops was too busy breaking in his disappearing act to save her from these mean streets that eat the meek in one swallow. Lies no longer need disguise when the truth is viewed as hollow through the eyes that need it most. We, descendants of stolen legacies, Children of ancestors who cannot be broken. Birthers and bearers of a culture that has been repeatedly robbed and ransacked to feed the spiritually famine like a black woman's bosom. We who become a pre-existing condition simply because we pre-exist. We who realize we are worthy. We are the guardians. We are the gardeners. We are the soil. We are the toil. We are the protectors of our seeds who need to be protected, who need to see true love and black excellence redirected, not through fame and fortune, but redirected through character and deed. And indeed, it is those who stand on the front line fighting for the minds of our young black and gifted. It is you who are an inspiration to me because you are the revolution we do not see on TV. Asante Sana. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm Jamal Warner. This, this This interview, this whole conversation just is a reinforcement to just be intentional about your art. Yeah, word is bomb. Everything you've been talking word about from the Cosby show to your spoken word, just be intentional about your art because this is the way we reach people. Yeah, it, yeah. Absolutely. And especially now, like, you know, especially in the music business, you know, or, or really any art, no one is making the money 
that they were making before. That's right? right. And now with streaming, we don't make money off of streaming, right? So this is an opportunity for artists to just really be about the art. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's really all we have. Like what le- what legacy can you leave? Um, and I'm just I'm just really big on, you know, there's so much nonsense out there. We talk about the the part of hip hop that's that's just trash, and I'm of the mindset of you know, let them have that. Let's provide something else. Let's show um, let's show that there is another way, uh, you know, to express yourself through, through poetry. Let's show let's highlight um, let's highlight the dope shit. That's right. You know, and if people you know see enough of the dopeness, you know, they can make a choice. All right. Well, we appreciate you for joining us, brother. Yo, and, thank you and, for having and, and me. What song thank you for having me. Playing view. You want us to get Ooh. it too? Ah, uh, man, I should have done hiding in plain view because that has doesn't have music. Asante Sana has music. Um, what's your um, what's usually your time length on? Well, we, on songs? we can't play a nine minute song if you got yeah. a nine minute. No, it's song, not nine you know? minute, but like this. Uh, Three to four. Black Black Fist Beautiful. That might be like six minutes. Uh, we can play some dope. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, dope. We can play some dope. of it. We can play some of it. We can play two, three okay. minutes of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the thing about my, you know, this this particular album, it's hard to do snippets to get the full story, you know. But you know what, though? But honestly, on the real, um, what would be dope for me uh, if y'all listen to it and decide which one resonates with you enough to play? Enough said. Yeah, I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen. I definitely appreciate it. Malcolm Jamal Warner. Yo, thanks for having me. Breakfast Club. Good morning.